Okay, so today uh, we are going to be looking at the book of Jonah, and this is the first uh, message in a new series where we're going to go through the minor prophets. So, what are the minor prophets? Well, the Old Testament is divided into four main parts. Um, if you're new to Christianity or new to coming to church, if you're a visitor, uh, we definitely are glad you're here. Uh, but so you might think of the Bible as one book. It is one book, but it's also a collection of 66 smaller books. And those are in two big groups, the New Testament, which was written after the time of Jesus, and the Old Testament written before Jesus. Um, so the minor prophets are part of the Old Testament, the part before Jesus. And the Old Testament is divided into four parts itself. So there are four parts. The first part is the law, which is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So that's the very first part, the law. Then we get into a section called the history books. That's things like 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Samuel. They're telling the history of the people of God, the nation of Israel. Then we get into a section called the wisdom literature. This is things like Psalms. We heard from one of the Psalms earlier today. A uh, book of Proverbs. There's wisdom books. Then finally, there's a section called the prophets, okay? The prophets are then divided into two smaller subsections, the major prophets and the minor prophets. And the only tangible difference between the major prophets and the minor prophets is the length of the books. The major prophets are longer and the minor prophets are shorter. But the minor prophets, because they're shorter, often get overlooked. Uh, if you grew up in church, you might be able to tell me something about the book of Isaiah, because it's often talked about at Christmas time. There's a lot of prophecies about Jesus in the book of Isaiah. But if I asked you to tell me about Habakkuk or Nahum, you might find that a little more challenging. But by the end of the semester, you are going to know a little bit about these books. And that's good because we believe that all of these books are part of God's word. They're all good for us. They're all God's revelation to us. We talked about that last week. We went over what we believe as a church about the Bible. We believe it's all the word of God, and we believe it's all about Jesus. So we're going to see more of that this semester as we go through these minor prophets. And today we're going to start with the book of Jonah. Uh, we're taking the minor prophets in chronological order, and Jonah is the first one in that chronological order. So who was Jonah? Well, the historical book, Second Kings, tells us that Jonah was a prophet during the time of King Jeroboam, which would be from 782 B.C. to 753 B.C. So, he was a prophet during the time of King Jeroboam. A prophet, what is that? Well, it's someone chosen by God to take God's message to the people. So, during the 8th century B.C., that's more than 2,700 years ago, Jonah was called by God to speak to the people on God's behalf. And the main idea for this book of Jonah is this, that God has tremendous compassion on us, for us, and on them, for them, whoever they are. So let's start with the opening verses of the book of Jonah and see what it says. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, get up, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because their evil has come up before me. Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. So in these opening lines, God told Jonah to go to Nineveh which is far in the east. But Jonah decides he's going to flee from God to Tarshish, which is far in the west. That's good to know a little bit about where these places are. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, located about 550 miles northeast of Israel in what is now Iraq. It was, for all practical purposes, for someone at this time in the nation of Israel, about as far east as they could imagine as far east as they knew anything about. Jonah hears this message to go to Tarshish, I mean, to go to uh, Nineveh. And instead he gets on a boat going to Tarshish, which is in Spain. Effectively as far west 
as he could probably go, all the way on the other side of the Mediterranean. Jonah wasn't just ignoring God's command. He was actively trying to get away from it, to go as far as he could away from God's command, as far west as he could from the city in the east. He wanted to make it impossible for himself to follow God's command. He wanted to be on the opposite end of the world from where God wanted him to be. But why would Jonah do this? Jonah's a prophet of God. Why would he run away from God's message? Well, there's some historical background that is important to know here. In the ancient Middle Eastern world, Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrians were known throughout the ancient world, and they were feared throughout this region. They were not only an empire that had grown through conquering their neighbors, they were known for their especially brutal treatment of these victims of their conquering. For example, uh, there's an archaeological journal that in 2001 had an article about this, and the title of the article is The Grizzly Assyrian Record of Torture and Death. Okay? And the article begins with these sentences. Assyrian national history, as it has been preserved for us in inscriptions and pictures, consists almost solely of military campaigns and battles. It is as gory and blood-curdling a history as we know. So that's the opening lines of this archaeology paper about the Assyrians. The Assyrians kept records of their kingdom, and those records focused almost entirely on military conquest. When the Assyrians kept records and said, what do we want the future to know about us? It was almost entirely military conquest. That was the pride of their nation, was that they defeated their neighbors. They viewed themselves almost entirely as conquerors. The Assyrians kept these records, and military leaders would keep records of their specific conquests and what they did to their victims. In one of those accounts, according to this archaeology paper, here's what one of the military leaders recorded about his battle. In strife and conflict, I besieged and conquered the city. I killed 3,000 of their fighting men with a sword. I captured many troops alive. I cut off some of their arms and hands. I cut off others by their noses, ears, and extremities. I gouged out the eyes of many troops. I made a pile of the living and one of the heads. I hung their heads on trees around the city. So that's his record of what he did. In another account, a leader detailed how they took the nobles of the city and killed them and skinned their bodies and put the skins on the city wall as a warning to everyone around them. The Assyrians used torture and killing as a warning, not only to the people they conquered of not to rebel, but so that this would spread throughout the region. So as they approached the next city, people knew, surrender now or this is what's going to happen to you. It was a warning to everybody. So this is the people that God calls to Jonah and says, go to these people. And so Jonah runs the other way. So then what happens after he runs? Let's continue reading. It says, But the Lord threw a great wind onto the sea, and such a great storm arose on the sea that the ship threatened to break apart. The sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his God. They threw the ship's cargo into the sea to lighten the load. Meanwhile, Jonah had gone down to the lowest part of the vessel and had stretched out and fallen into a deep sleep. The captain approached him and said, What are you doing sound asleep? Get up, call to your God. Maybe this God will consider us and we won't perish. Come on. The sailors said to each other, let's cast lots. Then we'll know who is to blame for this trouble we're in. So they cast lots, and the lot singled out Jonah. They said to him, tell us who is to blame for this trouble we're in. What is your business, and where are you from? What is your country, and what people are you from? He answered them, I am a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of the heavens, who made the sea and dry land. Then the men were seized by a great fear and said to him, What have you done? The men knew he was fleeing from the Lord's presence because he had told them. So they said to him, What shall we do to you so that the sea will calm down for us? For the sea was getting worse and worse. He answered them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea so that it will calm down for you. For I know that I am to blame for this great storm that is against you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to get back to dry land. But they couldn't because the sea was raging against them more and more. So they called out to the Lord, Please, Lord, don't let us perish because of this man's life, and don't charge us with the innocent blood. For you, Lord, have done just as you pleased. Then they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, 
and the sea stopped its raging. The men were seized by great fear of the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So in this chapter, we see some things. First, we see that there is just one God. First, we see that oh, that God Jonah is trying to run, run away from this God. But Jonah couldn't get away from God because God is the God over all creation. This passage reveals that God is in control of the sea and the weather. He's in control of the fish. There is no Neptune or Poseidon. There are no other gods beside him. This is the message from Genesis 1 and lots of other parts of the Bible. Our God is the one and only creator king of the entire universe. But also note that our God isn't an impersonal God, but the God who made a covenant with us. We've talked about this uh, many times before, including just last week, how that's the message of Genesis chapter 2. The creator king is also the God who loves us. He's the personal God of Israel. Look at verse 9. Jonah says, he answered them, I am a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of the heavens, who made the sea and the dry land. Now Jonah uses both of the most common names for God in the Old Testament. Yahweh, which in English Bibles is Lord with all capital letters, and Elohim. The Hebrew word Elohim just means the king. Jonah is saying that he worships the God who's in control, the king, but also the God who made a covenant and gave his personal name to the people, Yahweh. Now, of course, we can also note a little irony in here that Jonah is saying that he worships the God while he's literally running away from God. Jonah is sinning, but he still knows who God is, and he still considers himself a worshiper of God. And if you're a Christian and you're here today, you probably know well the feeling of sinning, knowing you're sinning, but still considering yourself a disciple of God. You know what it feels like to be running from God. You know what it feels like to be doing exactly the opposite of what God has told you to do and exactly the opposite of what God has told you not to do. And you're still doing it. So this can be an encouragement to us and a warning to us. The warning is that God knows and sees what we're doing. You can't run from him. He's everywhere. You can't get away from God. But the encouragement is that even in the middle of our sin, God still loves us. He's still the God of the covenant who is faithful to us even when we are not faithful to him. In fact, his faithfulness is our only hope. So this passage, we see here that there is just one God and that this God is in control, but also that this God cares about us. He loves us and he doesn't abandon us, even when we try to abandon him. That's our promise as Christians. The reason I am still a Christian week after week, year after year, decade after decade, isn't that I'm so committed to God that I just maintain my faith. It's because God is so committed to me that he keeps my faith. My promise is that I have the Holy Spirit living in me to keep me in my faith. He gave me this faith as a gift. He gave me the spirit as a gift. This is what Ephesians tells us. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God. It is God's gift, not from works so that no one can boast. If you have faith in Jesus, it's a gift. It's not from you. You did not create that, that faith or that gift. It was given to you. Because if the faith came from you, then you made the decisive act that saved you. And you did what led to your salvation. You were the one who believed. But God made it so that even in that belief, he gets the credit. He's the one who gave you the faith. He's the one who gave you the gift. Now, before we move on from chapter 1, I'll make a side note about what's happening in this story. Jonah gets swallowed by a giant fish in this chapter. If you grew up in church, you might have heard it's a whale. Okay, but the Bible just says a giant fish. We don't know what it was exactly. Um, and then Jonah spends three days and three nights before being spit out by this fish. So I want to say, we can be honest, this story sounds ridiculous. We can admit that. And it can be tempting to try to come up with all sorts of excuses for the story, 
We'll say it's an allegory, it's a fable or a myth or something like that. We can say it's, it's not meant to tell us what really happened, it's meant to teach some moral lesson, kind of like we do in children's stories with Jonah and things like that. But if we do that, if we try to make excuses for this, all we're really going to do is create more problems for ourselves because we face a bigger problem. Jesus said this story was true. In Matthew, Jesus said, He answered them, An evil and adulterous generation demands a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the huge fish three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at Jonah's preaching. And look, something greater than Jonah is here. So Jesus was saying that there was a real Jonah. There was a real fish. The preaching at Nineveh really happened. And more than that, Jesus is saying the story of Jonah was meant to point to the future death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So if you toss out this story as a myth or whatever, you lose Christianity. So while there are parts of the Bible that aren't meant to be taken literally, historically true, things like some of the Psalms, poetry, things like that, this story is meant to be understood as true history. So then how do we deal with something that sounds ridiculous, but we're told is true? Well, first we should begin where our faith begins with Jesus. If you're a Christian, you already believe that God himself became a human, lived a sinless life, was killed, was entombed, and then rose from the dead. Okay? If you can believe that, if you believe God can do that, then God can make a fish swallow a person and spit him up three days later. It's not really a problem. Of all the things Christians believe, this story is not the hardest thing to believe. And that relates to an issue that we might have with evangelism. There will be people who sometimes, when you're trying to talk about your faith, they'll bring up a story like this and say, come on, really? Like, seriously? You believe this children's story or whatever? They want to argue about the Old Testament stories, some of these things, and they want to use it to dismiss the Bible. If that happens to you, if you were talking to someone like that, I would recommend not trying to convince them of the story of Jonah. Instead, draw them to Jesus. Point them to Jesus. Say, that's not my faith. It's not ultimately in the story of Jonah. My faith is in Jesus. Let's talk about Jesus. We believe God became a man, lived on earth, was killed, and rose from the dead. Now, hypothetically, if that's true, could God also make a fish swallow, uh, swallow a man and spit him up three days later? Well, the obvious answer to that is yes. Okay? So let's deal with that part of our beliefs. So rather than worry about the story of Jonah or parting of the Red Sea or whatever, let's look at what Christians believe about Jesus. Because if what we believe about Jesus is true, then the rest takes care of itself. But if what we believe about Jesus isn't true, then who cares about the rest? None of it matters anyway. From our perspective as Christians, I would much rather convince someone that Jesus died for their sins and rose from the dead and have them wonder how Jonah could survive in a fish for three days than convince them that maybe Jonah really did. Maybe there's some scientific argument for how somebody could live in a fish, but then have them not believe in Jesus. I want them to believe in Jesus, and then the rest can work itself out. Because even if you convince them that Jonah is plausible, they're just going to move on to some other argument, the Red Sea parting or something like that. We want to talk to them about Jesus. We want to tell a non-Christian to focus on what really matters, which is Jesus. And then the rest can be worked out through discipleship. One final thing about the truthfulness of the story. If you do believe the story is true, you may wonder, was it a regular fish that just came along and swallowed Jonah? Or did God make this fish right then to swallow Jonah? We don't know. The text doesn't tell us because that's not the point of the story. It's a trivial curiosity, but it makes no difference to the point of the story. The point of the story, like the whole Bible, is to tell us about God and our relationship with God and ultimately point us to Jesus. So now, let's look at chapter 2.
Jonah prayed to the Lord from in, from oh, sorry. Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. I called to the Lord in my distress, and He answered me. I cried out for help from deep inside Sheol. You heard my voice. When He threw me into the depths, into the heart of the seas, the current overcame me, and your breakers and your billows swept over me. And I said, I have been banished from your sight. Yet I will look once more toward your holy temple. The water engulfed me up to the neck. The watery depths overcame me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. I sank to the foundations of the mountains. The earth's gates shut behind me forever. Then you raised my life from the pit, Lord my God. As my life was fading away, I remembered the Lord. And, I, and my prayer came to you, to your holy temple. Those who cherish worthless idols abandon their faithful love. But as for me, I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will fulfill what I have vowed. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. So, first thing we see here is that God is patient. Notice that this chapter begins with two things. First, Jonah prays to God. He's in a desperate situation, so he finally prays. And Jonah even recognizes that it's only in this desperation that he is willing to turn to God. Look at verse 7. As my life was fading away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you to your holy temple. Jonah finally remembered the Lord. The Lord didn't forget about Jonah. And of course, Jonah didn't really forget about God. Jonah was running from God, and he knew that God had sent the storm. But what he remembered here is that he could call out to God and that God would hear him. In other words, God was waiting for Jonah, and Jonah knew that. And so Jonah prayed to God. This is another relatable aspect of the story. How many times have we forgotten about God or been running from God? And then we run out of options. We reach the end. We reach the depths. And often in this final stage, as a last resort, we finally think, oh, maybe I should pray. Maybe I should ask God for help. But in those cases, God is waiting for us. He is patient because he knows our weaknesses and our faults. We're not surprising God when we fail, but he is faithful even in those failures. And a second thing to notice here is who Jonah prays to. Look at verse two. I called to the Lord in my distress, and he answered me. I cried out for help from deep inside Sheol. You heard my voice. And then verse seven again. As my life was fading away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you to your holy temple. And then in verse 9, But as for me, I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will fulfill what I have vowed. Salvation belongs to the Lord. In all three of these cases, he's referring to God as Yahweh. That word again, English translation, is Lord in all capital letters. That's the personal covenantal name that God gave to his people. His personal name. In chapter 1, he referred to God as Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God the covenantal creator king. But here he's focusing on God as that covenant-keeping God, the faithful God, the forgiving God, the loving God. He turns to God because he knows that God cares about him. He trusts God. Despite his open rebellion against God, despite the fact that he's trying to run from God, Jonah believes that he can turn to God and God will be there for him. Again, this should be an encouragement to us because if we're honest, we've all had that experience of only turning to prayer when we've tried everything else. And we've all had the experience of sinning and then returning to God based only on the fact that he is more faithful than we are. In both cases, we are able to return to God because of who he is. That's part of what it means to repent. In church, we often use the word repent, but we don't always define it and explain it. Repent just means to turn away from our sin and turn to God. When we first became Christians, we acknowledged that we're sinners and we acknowledged that our sin was evil. And so we turned away from that sin and we turned to God. When we forget about God, we just don't think about him and try everything on our own. And we only turn to God when we run out of options. That's repenting too. It's turning away from our sin and turning back to God. 
When we run from God and intentionally do things our own way, but we find that instead of bringing the good things that we hoped, it brought bad things, just as sin always does, we can turn back to God in that desperation. And that's repenting. And when we return to God, he forgives us and continues to work in our lives just as he has before. And that's what he does with Jonah here. And he offers that to everyone. So let's look at chapter 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach the message that I tell you. Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's command. Now Nineveh was an extremely great city, a three-day walk. Jonah set out on the first day of his walk in the city and proclaimed, In forty days Nineveh will be demolished. Then the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and dressed in sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least. When word reached the king of Nineveh, he got up from his throne, took off his royal robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he issued a decree in Nineveh. By order of the king and his nobles, no person or animal, herd or flock, is to taste anything at all. They must not eat or drink. Furthermore, both people and animals must be covered with sackcloth, and everyone must call out earnestly to God. Each must turn from his evil ways and from his wrongdoing. Who knows? God may turn and relent. He may turn from his burning anger so that we will not perish. God saw their actions, that they had turned from their evil ways. So God relented from the disaster he had threatened with them, and he did not do it. So we see here that God just picked up where he left off with Jonah. God called Jonah to take a message, and Jonah ran away. But God just repeated that call, and now this time, Jonah listens. Jonah went to Nineveh and delivered a message of destruction, that in 40 days the city would be destroyed. But the people of Nineveh repented of their sin, and so God did not destroy them. We see again here that God is patient and forgiving. He's not looking for reasons to destroy us. In fact, God is offering forgiveness and salvation. We see this in 2 Samuel 14, 14. For we will surely die and are like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. Yet God does not take away life, but thinks up ways so that the banished one will not be cast out from him. One thing the Bible teaches over and over again is that God offers salvation to everyone. This is true for reluctant evangelists like Jonah. It's true for the most brutal murderers in history. Remember that Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrians, and the Assyrians were known for their evil. They would conquer and torture their neighbors, and yet God warns them. And when they repent of their sin, God doesn't bring disaster. Now this passage doesn't clearly indicate whether the people of Nineveh were actually saved and will be in heaven. It just says he didn't bring disaster on them at this time because they repented. We don't know whether that repentance was lasting or not. We don't know a lot of the things about the situation. But we know that God wanted them to know who he is and that he both judges evil and accepts repentance. This is an important truth for Christians to understand. Many of you probably know the story of Jeffrey Dahmer, the serial killer who cut up and ate his victims. But you might not know that while he was in prison, he claimed to have come to trust in Jesus. There was a pastor who would visit him every week and talk to him and minister to him. And eventually that pastor baptized him. But this fact of what this pastor did actually led to his, his church splitting. There were people in the church who believed that nobody as bad as Jeffrey Dahmer could come to trust in Jesus. And they believed that John, Dahmer didn't deserve forgiveness, that it was wrong to go to him and baptize him. The pastor, Roy Ratcliffe, also performed the funeral of Dahmer. And during this funeral, here's what he said. Jeff confessed to me his great remorse for his crimes. He wished he could do something for the families of his victims to make it right, but there was nothing he could do. He turned to God because there was no one else to turn to, but he showed great compassion in his daring to ask the question, is heaven, or excuse me, he showed great courage in his daring to ask the question, is heaven for me too? I think many people are resentful of him in asking that question, but he dared to ask and he dared to believe the answer. So there were people in church 
who didn't believe God's offer of salvation was big enough for Jeffrey Dahmer. There's also a story of Henry Garrick, a German-American pastor who became an army chaplain during World War II. Because he was Lutheran and because he spoke German and was a German-American and he had experience in prison ministry before the war, the army chose him to be the chaplain to the Nazis on trial during the Nuremberg trials. He was a pastor to 10 Lutheran uh, Nazi war criminals. And during that time, Garrick said that six of those 10 repented. The first Nazi war criminal to be hanged was a man named Ribbentrop. Uh, Garrick, as Ribbentrop's pastor, walked with him all the way up to the platform where he was gonna be hanged. And as Ribbentrop was given his chance to say his last words, he said, I place all my confidence in the lamb who made atonement for my sins. May God have mercy on my soul. And then he turned to his pastor. And he said, I'll see you again. So he was a Nazi war criminal on his way to death. But he's hoping in Jesus' forgiveness that Jesus' forgiveness is that big. Now, I don't know if their repentance of these six people was real or not, but I do know that the Bible is clear over and over again that anybody can turn to Jesus. This is the message that is shocking and scandalous in our Bible. In our culture today, it's easy to talk about God as a loving God, and even as a forgiving God. It's easy to talk to him about as a patient God. But in our culture, we often draw a line and say that this is too much. These people are too far. Those who Jesus criticized in the story of the prodigal son, there were Pharisees that were mad that Jesus was reaching out to the worst, lowest members of society. They wanted a religious community of good people. And so Jesus told the story of a son who had gone off and sinned and squandered his wealth, his father's wealth. But then when he repented, he came back and he was celebrated and forgiven. But the older brother got je jealous and angry. And rather than celebrating the return of this prodigal brother, he wanted more for himself. He wanted more glory and power for himself. He thought he earned that. And this is something I see today in lots of ways. If we watch or read social media, you might see people who talk about how they left the church or left the faith because of bad things that happened to them in the church. They're like hashtags about it, church hurt. They have complaints about what happened in the church. But if you leave the church, and not just the local church, but the entire Christian community over someone sinning in the church, what you're revealing is that you were never a Christian to begin with. You never understood the gospel to begin with. Because if you had, you would know that we're all sinners. Even Christians, even lifelong church attenders, even church leaders, we're all sinners. So first, if you understand the message of the Bible and of the gospel, it wouldn't surprise you that people in the church are sinners. Leaving the church over that means that you expected those people in the church to be better than that. You expected the church to be full of good people. But even more than that, you abandon the faith in the church over someone's sin. It's revealing that you thought you were better than that. You thought you are better than them. You're convinced that you would never do those things that they did. And so you are a good person and they're not. They're bad people and you don't want to be around bad people. But as I mentioned, it was reading, I mentioned this last week, it was reading through First and Second Corinthians that brought me to faith. And what's amazing about that is if you read Corinthians, the church in there is totally screwed up. Uh, Paul said that they were sinning even worse than the neighboring non-Christians. But as I read that, I realized the Bible was telling the truth. We are sinners. Sure, there are better and worse sinners. I've never committed genocide like a Nazi war criminal. I have never killed people and ate them like Jeffrey Dahmer. All I did was yell at Luke Aiello once. <laughs> okay. But the fact is that Jesus' death paid for sin, not just minor sins, but for all sins. 
Jesus died for when you get angry driving and curse at another driver. But he also died for Jeffrey Dahmer and for Nazi war criminals and for the people of Nineveh. That's what we see in the book of Jonah. And we see that throughout the Bible. But as I said, the Bible is also truthful about the sinful hearts of every church member and even God's prophets. And so it's truthful about Jonah here. And let's look at chapter four. Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. He prayed to the Lord, please Lord, isn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled toward Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and one who relents from sending disaster. And now, Lord, take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. The Lord asked, is it right for you to be angry? Yep, okay. Jonah left the city and found a place east of it. He made himself a shelter there and sat in its shade to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God appointed a plant, and it grew over Jonah to provide shade for his head to rescue him from his trouble. Jonah was greatly pleased with the plant. When dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant, and it withered. As the sun was rising, God appointed a scorching east wind. The sun beat down on Jonah's head so much that he almost fainted, and he wanted to die. He said, it's better for me to die than to live. Then God asked Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plan? Yes, it's right, he replied. I'm angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you cared about the plant, which you did not labor over and did not grow. It appeared in a night and perished in a night. So may I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people who cannot distinguish between their right and their left, as well as many animals. So that's the end of the story. Jonah was yet another in the long line of people stretching for millennia who wanted God to forgive them, but not others. But again, we need to remember who the Assyrians were. They tortured and killed their enemies, and their existence would have been a threat to the nation of Israel. And eventually, about a half a century later, <coughs> the Assyrians would conquer Israel, and they would torture and kill many of the people of Israel. So on a human level, Jonah's anger and his disgust at these people is perfectly understandable. How can, let, how can God let the Assyrians get away with this? We want justice. We want them to suffer. We want them to be destroyed. Many of you might be too young to relate to this, but eight years ago, there was a radical Islamic group called ISIS that was executing Christians, and they were making grisly videos of these and putting them online. They would cut people's heads off, but not with swords, with like kitchen knives, okay? They locked people in cages and used a crane to drop the, lower the cage into water and drown these people slowly. They did horrible things to these people. Is God's offer of salvation big enough for them too? If one day you heard that some members of ISIS had repented, had become members of a church, and would probably be in heaven if their faith is real, would that make you happy or angry? Uh, back in 2000, I was on an overseas mission trip, and I met a woman named Miha. I'm anticipating the story, so hold on. <laughs> Okay, so I met Miha while I was overseas. And she was a woman serving in college ministry. Then a few years later, Jennifer went overseas and served with Miha. And we've kept in touch with Miha for 20 plus years. Well, for several years, Miha was living and serving in Islamic area. And she would send us updates and emails. And here's an email. Okay, this is from 2013. She sent us this. In September 2011, I sent you an email asking for your urgent and fervent prayers on behalf of our dear Pakistani brother, Alar, who had been kidnapped on his way to an airport in Pakistan by a group of Muslim extremists. Take a deep breath. Take a drink of water. Okay, I'm good. 
After four months of prayer and hope that our brother is still alive, we received the great news of his release in January of 2012. Through other friends, I've learned bits and pieces about his situation, how after his release in the past few months, or after his release in the past few months. Last week, though, I had the great privilege to see our brother Alar again. This man's life is filled with miracle after miracle, and his testimony about the four months of captivity is yet another example of God's great power, grace, and love. As I was listening to him sharing about his experience in prison, I felt like I'm reading another page from the book of Acts and like I'm sitting face to face with the Apostle Paul or Peter. It was so encouraging, inspiring, and challenging. Alar's father, who was also a follower of Jesus, had been kidnapped two weeks before Alar, but he was released shortly after that. He was beaten in the head many times and now loses his memory easily. He's 56. One year after Alar's release, Alar is fully recovered physically and emotionally, and he gained back some of the weight he had lost in captivity. He was beaten every day in prison. He was beaten every day in prison, and they would hang him upside down through the night in a small, dark, and smelly room. And they would ask him two questions over and over again. How many Muslims have you converted to Christianity? And who are the foreigners you're working with? They beheaded five other Muslims accused of being spies in front of him and lined their heads for him to see and threatened him that he'll be next. One day, they were drilling into his belly with a thick drilling machine, and they hanged him upside down in the small room and let the blood drip slowly from his belly to his face. His mouth... His mouth and nose were full of blood, and he couldn't breathe anymore. He thought that was the end, and he asked Jesus to take him home because of the pain being so unbearable. And then a miracle happened. The heavy stench in the room disappeared. He was still hanging upside down, but he felt as if someone was holding him horizontally, like he was laying on a bed. He heard a voice telling him, Do not be afraid. I am with you. I will give you strength to go through this. He said that after all, even though he was very weak physically and couldn't even walk without his torturers holding him up by his arms, his spirit was peaceful and joyful. His interrogators confiscated his computer and searched through his files. They saw the copy of the Jesus movie and many pictures with, whom, uh, uh, with people whom Alar had helped through his disaster relief work. They asked him many questions about Christianity, and he felt as if they were very interested. Every time he was answering these kinds of questions, they would stop beating him and just listen. At some point, his interrogators, at some point, his interrogators told him that they feel that they are bigger sinners than him. Alar said all the time he felt that God had allowed him to go through this experience and be there for those people to have the chance to hear about Jesus. Otherwise, who would tell them? After his release, many people advised him to leave the country for some time and to hide, but he felt God telling him to go back to his people. Three months later, his main interrogator called him on his new phone. Alar was surprised and concerned. The man wanted to see him again. Alar went to meet with him, and the interrogator told him that he's very interested in Jesus and wants to become a follower. Alar shared the gospel with him again, and he believed. So this is the gospel. This is the message that we see in Jonah and throughout the Bible. Jonah wanted the people of Nineveh to be destroyed, but God is different. He wants people to re repent and be forgiven. There's a small detail here that's easy to miss. Jonah wasn't commanded to tell the people of Nineveh to repent. He was commanded to tell them of destruction coming. He wasn't commanded to offer them forgiveness. He was commanded to proclaim destruction. And yet at the end, Jonah says, Please, Lord, isn't this... Let me slide. Please, Lord, isn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled toward Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, 
abounding in faithful love and one who relents from sending disaster. Jonah knew that even if God promised destruction on Nineveh, he is a gracious and compassionate God. And if Nineveh repented, God would send them grace and mercy instead of destruction. God is a gracious and compassionate God. And Jonah knew who God is. God had explained this clearly in the book of Jeremiah. At one moment, I might announce concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will uproot, tear down, and destroy it. However, if that nation about which I have made the announcement turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the disaster I planned to do to it. Another time I might announce concerning a nation or kingdom that I will build and plant it. However, if it does what is evil in my sight by not listening to me, I will relent concerning the good I had said I would do to it. This little easily overlooked part of the Bible story here in Jonah can help us understand so much of the Bible. For example, as you read through the book of Psalms, there are things called imprecatory prayers. Big fancy word that means when the Psalms are calling for people to be destroyed, sometimes in very graphic language. But when David, for example, prays for the destruction of his enemies, we should understand the context. They weren't just people opposed to David. They were evil people opposed to God's people and bringing harm to the nation. And so it's right to want justice. It's right to want God to stop them. But even in that, we should be like God and prefer their salvation to their destruction. We can read those Psalms and understand that David prayed for an end to the evil, but would have rejoiced had they come to faith and repented instead. And today we can pray for evil to be stopped. If there's a murderer on the loose, we can pray for God or the police to stop them. If there's a terrorist group attacking innocent people, we can pray that that group would be destroyed. We can pray for the military to destroy them. We can want evil wiped off the face of the earth. But in that, we can say, like God, that if they repent and turn to God, we would rejoice. We would rather them repent and be saved than be destroyed and cast into hell. This is because we know that we are also awful sinners, every single one of us. Yet, yes, some have done bigger, worse, more awful things in human terms. But every single one of us has sinned against God. And since God is an infinite God, every sin against him is an infinite sin, worthy of destruction. And yet, if you're a Christian, you have been completely forgiven. Not just the small sins, but all the sins. The Apostle Paul killed Christians, but then he became one. He was forgiven and became a leader in the church. The great scandal of Christianity isn't that someone as awful as Paul or as awful as a Muslim terrorist can be forgiven. The scandal of Christianity is that any of us can be forgiven. God knows your every sin. He knows your every thought. He knows the secret things that you hope nobody ever knows about you. And yet, if you have trusted in Jesus, all of those sins have been washed away. His death paid the penalty for your sin. If you're not a Christian here, then this offer is being made to you right now. You have the chance to turn away from your sin, to admit that you have done evil things, whether they're small evils or big evils. Maybe you've lied. Maybe you've said bad things about people. Maybe you've hurt people in smaller ways. Maybe you tortured and killed somebody. Hopefully not. But whatever it is, when you turn from your sin and turn to God, you can be forgiven. Not because you earned it. You can't earn it. But rather because Jesus lived a perfect sinless life in your place and he died in your place. He took the penalty. He didn't deserve any penalty, but he took your penalty. And after that, he was put into a tomb and he was raised back to life life three days later. He defeated death, and now he offers that eternal life to you. If you want to turn to God, then just pray to him, talk to him, and tell him that you confess your own sinfulness, and that you trust in Jesus as your Savior and as your Lord. And then talk to one of us about it after church, during our lunch. If you have any questions, talk to us. And if you're already a Christian here, then look at the story of Jonah. Look at the message of salvation that is portrayed here. 
It's not salvation just for church folk who are basically good. This is a message of salvation for everyone, even people who we might want to hate or people we might fear. As Christians living in America today, spending our time on a college campus, there probably aren't many people you hate and fear in this way. But there might be people you think are just too far away from God to hear the message of salvation. There are definitely people on this campus living lives that are very clearly against God's will. There are people who are living in ways that we don't want them to live. We know that God has something better for them. But like Jonah, we have been called to take the good news of Jesus into their world, into the places where people aren't living for him. The people on this campus who don't trust in Jesus are just as lost as the people in Nineveh. They need Jesus just like the people of Nineveh did. And they will only hear about Jesus if God sends someone to tell them. And God has sent you. Last year, we studied through the book of Acts. And that's the message of Acts. We, as individual Christians and as members of this church collectively, have been commanded to go out into the world and take the good news to them. Starting where we are and continuing throughout the world. You might not look at the other people at Florida Poly and want them to be destroyed. The way, Je uh, the, the way Jonah wanted the people of Nineveh to be destroyed. But ask yourself, do you care enough about them to go and tell them the good news? We don't know whether Jonah ever repented of his hatred for Nineveh. The Bible doesn't tell us, just like it doesn't tell us where the fish came from, because that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is that God cares about people more than we do. He cares about us just as he cared about Jonah. And he cares about the people outside the church just as he cared about the people of Nineveh. The story of Jonah doesn't leave you with a clean, happy ending all tied up in a bow because truthfully, the story isn't over yet. The story continues every single day of your life. Do you care about the people outside of the church enough to go and tell them about Jesus? If you realize that maybe you don't, or at least you haven't, then that's a sin. But the good news is Jesus died for that sin too. You can repent of that sin. You can confess it to God and ask him to help you. You can ask God's spirit to change your heart and give you a more Christ-like attitude to those who are outside the church. And you can ask God to be with you and empower you as you go about this campus and share the good news. Because this great campus of Florida Poly has more than a thousand people who can't distinguish their right from their left. And we are here to point them to Jesus because God has tremendous compassion on us and them. So let's close with a prayer. Father, we come to you knowing that you are the great compassionate God. You are the powerful God who created the universe, who created everything, who controls the oceans, who controls the weather, who controls the fish, but you are also the personal God who made people to be in a relationship with you and who chose a people to be your people and called us to be part of that. We know that you gave us the faith to trust in you, to love Jesus, through whom we have been forgiven because his death, burial, and resurrection paved the way and made the way for us to be reunited with you. We confess that too often we don't see even or think about the suffering lost people in the world around us. We might be judgmental of them and think they're sinners who have just simply rebelled against you and don't deserve your forgiveness, forgetting that we also rebel against you and don't deserve your forgiveness. But just as you forgave us, even when we were enemies of Christ, you offer that forgiveness to them. And just as we heard the gospel from someone who cared enough to tell us, help us to care enough to tell others the gospel. And just as you worked in our heart to give us the faith, we ask that you work in their hearts and give them faith. Work through us and through your word as we proclaim your word.
by your spirit, change their hearts and draw them into faith. Draw them into our church community. Give us the joy of seeing people repent. Give us the joy of seeing more people come into the kingdom of God. Give us a heart that wants this so badly that we will pay whatever cost, take whatever risk to go out and share your good news. By your spirit, give us wisdom and empower us in how we do that. And give us the success that only you can give because your calling in our lives is not that we convert people, that, but just that we are faithful in following your command to go out and share your good news. And we leave the results to you and we give all the glory to you. And we say all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.